much wrong with Vauxhall's seventh generation K-Series Astra that a few good engines wouldn't have sorted out. These have been added as part of the updates made here, delivering efficiency gains that might cause careful family hatchback buyers to see this car in a whole new light. The hatch and Sports Tourer variants on offer both get extra technology too. Think you know the Astra? Maybe it's time to take another look. According to Vauxhall, over a quarter of all British drivers have at some point either owned or driven an example of their Astra family hatch in the 40 years that this model line's been on sale. A pretty significant car for our market then, and it still is. Hence the importance of the changes made to this seventh generation model. Improvements that the brand hopes will rejuvenate its appeal. That would be timely, firstly because this model has to now face down completely new versions of its two biggest family hatch rivals, the Ford Focus and the Volkswagen Golf. And secondly, because the appeal of this car amongst private buyers has rather waned in recent years. Astra sales are still strong, but that's mainly because 80% of production goes to fleets. It's really quite rare these days to find an individual prepared to ignore the appeal of glitzy arrivals or trendy SUVs and put down money for one. Vauxhall's out to convince you that you should, and to that end has given this car a completely fresh lineup of all aluminium, three cylinder petrol and diesel power plants mated to a revitalized range of transmissions. Now, we'd expected that the engines would be borrowed from Peugeots and Citroëns, as has been the case with most new Vauxhalls that have been launched since the PSA Group's takeover of the brand back in 2017. But no, these date from the General Motors era. Despite that, they offer class-leading running cost figures that are significantly better than before with updated Euro emissions compliance, uh, which should bring key tax savings, particularly to business buyers. Other changes to this uh, seventh generation K-Series model are less significant. There's still the same choice of either five-door hatch or sports tourer estate models, but both body styles get a few equipment updates and some minor styling tweaks. To be fair, relatively few changes in other areas were really needed. We always recommended this design highly as an all-round driver's car and, if it was priced rightly, as a complete family hatchback package. Plus, for what it's worth, it's still made in this country and it's the only Vauxhall apart from the Vivaro van that now is, although that looks as if it might change in the future. For the time being, though, this Astra wears its British badge proudly and it wants to convince you that the 3 million UK sales that this model line's racked up since 1979 undergird a product with a depth of development that rivals just can't match. It's certainly an underrated car, but is it one you should consider buying? Let's find out. We'd forgotten just how good the Astra is to drive, and we're not alone. Cast around for opinions on the dynamically most adept family hatchbacks, and this Vauxhall probably won't even figure, but Rob Wilson knows different. Now, you won't have heard of him, but most Formula One stars have. He's the highly respected driver coach that, over the years, many of them have turned to in a quest to improve their skills on a circuit that was created by Rob at the Bruntingthorpe Airfield in Leicestershire. Now, for tuition on this track, you'd expect him to have chosen something all low-slung and exotic, or perhaps some kind of race refugee. But instead, Wilson's car of choice for many years has been an ordinary Vauxhall Astra. It has, he says, a beautiful balance, one you wouldn't expect normally to find in a car of this kind. And in the improved version of this uh, seventh generation model, it's even better, aided by revised spring and damper rates that improve the ride over poor surfaces and by a fresh calibration for the steering, which improves handling at higher speeds. Uh, Rob reckons the changes have made this car significantly faster around his circuit and Racing Point F1 driver Lance Stroll, who has lapped it incessantly, apparently he likes his Astra so much that he's thinking of buying one and adding it to his Canadian collection of cars which have been influential to his career. All of which is rather surprising because uh, this Vauxhall's fundamental engineering CV looks no more promising than it did when we first tested this K-Series design back in 2015. 
There's still, for example, no sign of the sophisticated multi-link rear suspension setup that the so-called magazine experts will tell you makes so much difference to the fine driving dynamics of more powerful Golf and Focus models in this segment. Uh, the engineers behind this car rejected that idea from the outset on the grounds of cost and packaging compromise. Instead, they stuck with proven technology, a straightforward torsion beam rear axle, and then they embellished that with the addition of a clever Watts linkage suspension system. Now that is apparently there to reduce sideways motion between the axle and the body of the car as you go through the corners, hence the beautiful balance that we referenced earlier. That whole setup works especially well on this Mark 7 Astra design, partly because the uh, body shell is particularly stiff and partly because so much weight was taken out of it at this design's original launch. Entry-level petrol versions of this car now tip the scales uh, no more than around 1.2 tonnes, uh, which is more the kind of figure that you'd expect to find in a smaller Super Mini. Here again, this revised model has improved things further with an additional six kilos of weight on petrol versions saved and as part of the switch away from 1.4 litre four cylinder engines. Now you can still get a green pump fueled 1.4 litre Astra, but now it's a three cylinder unit and it can only be had with 145 PS uh, in a form mated to a seven speed CVT auto gearbox. Now that might suit our older town based buyers, but everyone else in search of a petrol powered Astra will almost certainly gravitate towards the alternative 1.2 litre three cylinder unit, which is only offered with manual transmission and that's the engine that the majority of buyers uh, of this Vauxhall are now expected to choose. We'd expected both this 1.2 litre power plant and all the new engines added into this improved model to be the PSA group units borrowed from Peugeot and Citroen, uh, which you'll find in the current Corsa and in both the Vauxhall's SUVs. But work on the enhanced engines earmarked for this Astra was already well underway when the PSA group bought the Vauxhall and Opel brands from General Motors in 2017, and the French conglomerate decided to see it through. Uh, why? We're not quite sure, because the, uh, the production life of those units is likely to be extremely short, given that the next generation Astra is certain to be a thoroughly PSA group engineered product. That is something of a pity, because this Vauxhall's freshly installed 1.2 litre power plant is really rather impressive. It offers a sparkling, eager, revy feel, an electrically controlled variable vane turbo, more swiftly builds boost, and it benefits from a balancer shaft to quell the vibrations that you would find in some other three-cylinder installations, uh, Ford's rival EcoBoost unit, for example. Uh, for Astra drivers, it comes in three flavors with 110, 130, and 145 PS. Uh, the different outputs separated only by tiny software tweaks. At first glance, the performance figures don't seem to vary very much between those three variants. Rest to 60 takes 10.2 seconds in the 110 PS model, 9.9 uh, .9 in the 130 PS version, and 9.7 in the 145 PS variant. On the road though, there's more difference than you might think, and an extra 30 newton meters of torque, uh, which has been injected into the top two derivatives, makes quite a lot of difference to the top speed, which rises from 124 to 134 miles an hour in the 130 PS model, and then on to 130 seven miles an hour in the 145 PS version and that really can feel like quite good fun. As in the original version of this Mark 7 model, a slight issue is the relative lack of feedback from the steering. Uh, the altered calibration doesn't seem to have helped that very much, uh, which is a pity because the helm's accurate and well weighted. You just have to learn to trust it in a way that isn't necessary in impressive handling rivals that we've recently tried, like Ford's Focus and the Mazda 3. Um, we didn't think that adding another 115 kilos into the nose of the car would help much in that regard, and it doesn't. Now that's what will happen if you decide to ignore the current zeitgeist and specify a diesel engine in your Astra instead. Uh, this is another new three-cylinder unit, uh, this time 1.5 litres in size and offered with either 105 PS or, as in this case, 122 PS. You almost certainly want the gutsier version, uh, which improves the baseline unit's performance figures, rest to 60 miles an hour in 10.4 seconds, en route to 124 miles an hour to 9.9 .9 seconds and 130 miles an hour. 
that's if you specify the manual 1.5 litre 122 PS model. Vauxhall wanted us to try the automatic variant for this test, mainly because the uh, self-shifting torque converter transmission in question is completely new. It's the company's first nine-speed auto. And it certainly shifts smoothly between the ratios, but it isn't as willing to kick down as instantly as we'd like at short notice, at which point you uh, do rather notice this diesel's rather vocal character. And that's something that's also evident when the car's idling. Don't get us wrong, in refinement terms, it's certainly a useful improvement over the old 1.6-litre CDTI unit, and there are really no significant issues at cruising speeds, and those are aided by this revised design's aerodynamic improvements. Overall, though, rival diesels in this class still feel a little more hushed. Mind you, they are usually much less efficient, and we're going to get to that later in the cost section of this film. Is there anything else you need to know about the drive experience on offer here? Well, not much. Uh, there aren't any other engines on offer. Uh, there's nothing more powerful and more significantly, there's nothing that's in any way electrified, which is something of a disappointment given the direction of the current market. Uh, now, we referenced this car's improved ride earlier, uh, potholes, speed humps and tarmac tears and are dispatched with greater fluency. Uh, that's providing you stick to the smaller wheel size and the cameras which control this car's front and rear safety features have been improved. Uh, the former lens is now capable of identifying pedestrians and of braking the car to avoid them uh, should your attention be elsewhere. Um, it is, in fact, in short, a strong showing. Is it strong enough to sustain sales of this car against completely redesigned versions of both its toughest competitors? Well, only time will tell. Midterm facelifts are usually all style over substance. Here it's the other way around, which is good, but ideally the Astra needed both if it was to reassert his position towards the head of the family hatchback segment. Fortunately for Vauxhall, most close rivals also look a touch conservative, perhaps as an antidote to a sea of overstyled SUVs. To be fair, there's not much wrong with the smart silhouette. It was originally inspired by the brand's Monza concept car of 2014, and it was penned by British designer Mark Adams. As before, there's a choice of two body styles, this five-door hatch or an alternative sports tourer estate. You'd need to be a salesperson or a fanatically loyal Astra owner to notice the visual changes made, and they're only really evident at the front. Uh, the twin chrome lines that previously flanked the central brand badge on the grille have been replaced by a single silver strip here. Now that flows into the daytime running light elements in the headlamps, which now feature full LED illumination on most models. Plus, they offer the option of matrix technology, which will adapt elements of the beam to specific road conditions. Uh, the bumper has been revised too, uh, to incorporate these revised corner cutouts for the fog lamps, which on plusher models like this one now sit below chrome strips. Uh, more significant though is a feature that you can't see, and that's the way that the upper and lower portions of the grill now automatically open and close independently of each other, and that's primarily to reduce aerodynamic drag. There aren't any changes made in profile apart from some fresh wheel rim designs, which as before vary in size between 16 and 18 inches. Uh, we've got the 17 inch multi-spoke alloys here. Uh, the key side perspective design feature remains this unusual divided C pillar, which is there to create the impression of a floating roof. Like other GM models designed in its era, this one gets a characteristic lower blade line flowing up from the sills towards the rear, uh, while above it there's an equally distinctive higher crease. The alternative Sports Tourer Estate variant sits on a lengthier wheelbase, uh, so it measures in at a substantial 332 millimetres longer. There aren't any significant changes to talk about at the rear. Uh, the stretched taut surfaces still look sleek and we like the way that the interplay of light and shadow is emphasized by this central crease that sits above the brand logo there and it links the rear lights. Uh, the digital rear view camera that would be fitted back here on the flagship variant is apparently now of much higher quality so if you do have a version of this Vauxhall that has it you won't now be viewing a dashboard image that looks like something from TV in the 80s. Uh, of course as usual what's more important is the stuff that you can't 
see the lightweight vehicle architecture which allowed the original version of this K-series 7th generation model to save around 200 kilos over the curb weight of its predecessor. Right, let's take a seat at the wheel. Now you don't expect a cabin redesign with a facelifted model. Uh, usually there are just a few trim embellishments, uh, maybe a different infotainment screen. Well, there's hardly anything here, just a few different upholstery and door card finishes, uh, which to be frank, aren't really much of an improvement. It is just as well then that few fundamental changes were really needed. As before, the characteristic fascia element is what Vauxhall refers to as a blade style panel that stretches right across the cabin and that remains ergonomic, quite nicely finished and on a plusher variant like this one, relatively smart. Although there's not the depth of quality that you would feel in a rival Volkswagen Group product. That is especially the case lower down the range. With plusher variants like this one though, the brand of course has tried a bit harder with extras like leather seats and this superb stitched three spoke sports steering wheel. Uh, the rest of the decor is the kind of thing that you now routinely find on a car of this kind. Shiny piano black decorates the face shirt, the center stack and the door pulls with silver highlights around the gear stick, the control dials, uh, the vents and the instrument gauges. With the original version of this 7th generation K-series model, the big cabin talking point was the inclusion of the OnStar concierge system, which, at the press of a button, connected you through to an operator who was able to supply journeying info and help 24-7 in the case of an emergency or a breakdown. That old GM-sourced setup has now been replaced by another optional package, eCall, uh, which Vauxhall promises will do much the same thing, although, unlike OnStar, it isn't capable of uh, downloading destination directions into the sat-nav straight from the operator. Talking of navigation, you'll find it fitted on most models, uh, the mapping viewed on a central dash touchscreen that'll be either 7 inches or, as in this case, 8 inches in size, depending on the spec level that you stretch to, uh, as well as the usual DAB tuner and Bluetooth connectivity. All the monitors on offer feature Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring, and that's without the kind of subscription levy that rival brands often ask for uh, for that kind of setup after a few years of use but you'll have to stretch to this bigger screen to get any sort of voice activation. As part of this 8-inch screen multimedia Navi Pro package, you also get a digital instrument cluster. Well, a kind of digital instrument cluster anyway. Uh, the binnacle display you view here through the steering wheel is also 8 inches in size, which isn't big enough to show the kind of full mapping that other mass market models are now starting to introduce into their instrument cluster screens. In fact, there is still quite a lot that's a completely analog here, either side of the central monitor. Uh, those conventionally needled outer gauges for revs, for temperature and fuel, they don't light up until you twist the ignition key. The middle digital part of the layout though can certainly show you an awful lot. Two crescent-shaped virtual gauges, oil temp on the left and battery voltage on the right, flank a central screen offering two configurable layout themes, Touring, which gives you a prominent digital speedo, and Sport, which gives you a circular dial-shaped virtual speed gauge. As well as those two styles of velocity reading, uh, there's also space here to view plenty else. A left tab option shortcuts you into info, audio, nav and phone settings, while a right tab option allows you to tailor the full list of data that the central screen can show. And there's an awful lot of it. Uh, trip computer info, remaining oil life, tire pressures, a timer, traffic sign readouts, driver assistance settings, uh, your following distance to the vehicle in front, info on cabin energy consumers, an economy trend graph, an eco index screen that shows how frugally you're driving, and on a diesel, your add blue fluid level two. With the sport layout, where all this appears in the center of the circular virtual speed gauge, you can also insert a digital speed readout. 
Enough on screens. Uh, most Astra trim levels don't give you this fancy multimedia Navi Pro package, so you only get the center dash monitor, and through the steering wheel, you'll view a little trip computer readout, which is flanked by conventional analog gauges. Uh, the speedometer, like the one on this model's virtual screen, is rather annoyingly delineated in 20 miles an hour increments, which means that you'll miss out on the important 30 and 70 miles an hour markers. What else? Um, well, we should probably reference the fact that Vauxhall has finally got around to offering a couple of extra cost features which uh, the competitor models have provided for ages, a wireless phone charging mat and also a heated windscreen. And selected top models can now add in a high-end Bose sound system with a rich bass subwoofer under the boot floor. We'll finish with the basics. Uh, finding a comfortable driving position is straightforward, and that's courtesy of ample steering wheel and seat adjustment. Uh, on the base variants, we'd want to pay the small amount extra that Vauxhall asks for the 16-way adjustable driver's ergonomic active seat, which holds you more comfortably and securely. It includes lumbar support, and it's certified by the German AGR organization, who campaigned for seat design that's better suited to healthier backs. Unfortunately, the 12-way adjustable leather-clad chairs fitted to top models like this one aren't quite as supportive. Anyway, uh, once you've got yourself as comfortable as you can be, then you'll find that your uh, forward view is pretty good, and that's thanks to narrow windscreen pillars and decently sized front side windows. Unfortunately, the thick rear pillars obscure rearward visibility, so it is disappointing to find that parking sensors cost quite a lot extra on virtually all models, and that rear view camera we mentioned earlier isn't even available across most of the range. Cabin storage meets the required class standard. Uh, the glove box is big, it incorporates coin slots and a pen clip, and it's the only one we can think of in a PSA grip model which isn't severely compromised in size by the fuse box behind the dashboard. <laughs> That's because, of course, uh, this car wasn't originally designed as a PSA grip model. Uh, what else? Um, well, the door bins, they're reasonably sized. They'll take a couple of 500 mil bottles, but those bottles will jiggle about because the, uh, the molding isn't fashioned into any sort of holder for them. Uh, there is a phone sized cubby here embedded in the center stack, but you probably won't want to put your phone in there uh, because uh, there are no USB ports nearby. Uh, you'll find those instead in this small lidded box between the seats, and that also incorporates an SD card slot and an aux in point. Just in front, there's a compartment with a sliding cover which conceals two cup holders, and nearby is a 12 volt port. An overhead sunglasses compartment that's missing, and for some reason, uh, the sun visors have ticket clips mounted on their forward facing sides. But this spacious compartment down here by the driver's right knee is very handy. Right, let's take a seat in the back. Uh, now, looking at this Astra's tapering roofline, you might expect rear cabin space to be a touch restricted, so let's see. Now, the door opens nice and wide, which is good, but because of the angular rear C-pillar design, you'll have to step around this rather prominently pointed trailing edge. Once inside, it's actually a lot more spacious than the exterior dimensions and the outward styling lead you to expect. Now, with the original version of this Mark 7 Astra, the designers pulled off the magic trick of reducing the wheelbase by 20 millimeters uh, at the same time as improving rear legroom by 35 millimeters. Uh, we're still surprised by that. Uh, there is almost as much space for your knees as you'd find in a Skoda Octavia, and that is the family hatch class leader in this regard. Uh, scalloped front seat backs help here, as does the way that you can uh, slide your feet properly right under the seat in front. There's even decent headroom too, and because the central transmission tunnel is nice and low, a third middle-seated adult can be accommodated uh, without too much spatial embarrassment should the need arise. Not such good news for Vauxhall dealers is the fact that all this rear cabin space virtually matches what you get in the brand's apparently bigger Insignia model. Um, a central armrest that is provided, but unfortunately uh, it doesn't incorporate any cup holders. Uh, there are roof-mounted reading lights, there are seat back pockets, uh, there are coat hooks, by the overhead grab handles, and in the doors there are uh, reasonably sized 
bins and there's a further little cubby by the power window switch. Plusher models like this one is uh, get centrally mounted twin USB ports and rear seat heating too. Finally, let's take a look at luggage space. And that's another area you'd think might have been compromised by this seventh generation model slight reduction in size. Actually, when you raise the tailgate in this hatch version, there's a very usable 370 litre space that's measured up to the parcel shelf. Now true, that isn't an especially noteworthy figure by current class standards, but it isn't a bad showing for a car that's less than 4.4 metres in length. Uh, now earlier we did mention the uh, Sports Tourer version's longer wheelbase. Well, as you'd expect, uh, that does facilitate for much greater level of capacity, 540 litres. That's a figure that stays the same, even if you add in the optional spare wheel. That that isn't though the case in this hatch version where adding in the spare means a higher boot floor. Still, in this case, uh, there is at least uh, space underneath the cargo base around the tyre and the wheel for odd items that you might want to keep out of sight. In terms of boot usability, you get a couple of bag hooks and the usual four tie-down points. Uh, there's no sign of a 12-volt socket though. Um, if you need more room and you want to fold the rear seats, then you'd ideally want the convenient 40-20-40 split backrest that we have featured here. But that's only included on the priciest trim level and it can't be had as an option. So you'll probably be stuck with a more conventional 60-40 split, which means if you want to take long items, then you'll be inconveniencing rear seated folk. What about when you push everything forward? Well, normally on cars like this one, which can't be specified with an adjustable height boot floor, as is unfortunately the case with this Astra, you tend to get quite a step up in the boot floor over the folded seats. Uh, the higher boot floor that comes with that optional spare wheel avoids that issue here. Uh, with everything folded in this hatch body style, there's 1,210 litres of space, and that's measured up to the roof. In the Sports Tour Estate, that figure rises to 1,650. 30 litres. Vauxhall is keen to point out that list pricing hasn't changed much, and that's despite the more sophisticated engine technology and the higher levels of equipment. Uh, from the launch of this revised model, that meant figures kicking off from around £19,000 and rising to around 30000 at the top of the range. If you want the Sports Tourer Estate variant rather than this five-door hatch, then you'll need to budget for an extra premium of around £1,500. Forget any ideas you might have had of ordering an Astra in base three-door hatch form or indeed as either a hot hatch VXR, a GTC Coupe or as any sort of convertible. Variants like that are no longer part of Vauxhall's business plan. That is understandable in the current market, but a complete absence of the kind of mild hybrid, plug-in or full electric technology that rivals now offer isn't. Now this will be corrected when this K-Series Astra model makes way for a PSA Group platform replacement model in due course. But let's focus more on what you can have right here and right now. The core trim levels, base SE, business edition nav and SRI nav apply both to this five door hatch and to the sports tourer body style. Uh, this hatch also adds some extra spec level options, two for mid-range buyers, a straight SRI version without navigation and a better equipped SRI VX line model and two for the top of the range, the plush elite nav spec we're trying here and the top luxurious ultimate nav trim. What about engines? Well, as you may have seen in the driving experience section of this film, the core part of the lineup is built around Vauxhall's fresh range of three cylinder, 1.2 litre petrol and 1.5 litre diesel power plants. Now, if you're focusing on petrol power, it's very difficult to see why you wouldn't pay the 300 pound premium necessary to go from the base 110 PS unit to the gutsier 130 PS engine. With plusher trim levels, there's an equally small premium to go further and get the perkiest 145 PS 1.2 litre variant, which would probably be our Astra version of choice in the current lineup. A little confusingly, there is also a second petrol engine Astra offering 145 PS. This one makes a 1.4 litre engine to a stepless CVT auto gearbox, and it's aimed primarily at older, low mileage private buyers. 
Most business buyers loyal to Astra Motoring will give those petrol units a mere cursory glance on their way to sign an order for another diesel. Uh, the 1.5 litre black pump fueled unit requires a premium of just over £1,000 over its petrol counterpart and it kicks off in base 105 PS guys at around the £20,000 price point. Most will want to pay the £425 premium to get that engine in its uprated 122 PS guys and if you do that and you've chosen the hatch body style you'll be offered the further option of paying £1,655 more to add in Vauxhall's latest nine-speed auto gearbox and that is a package that we're trying here. Before we go on to look at how this pricing compares to direct rivals from other brands, it's probably worth mentioning how that positions this Astra in Vauxhall's wider model range. Now, there's long been quite a price overlap between this car and its larger Insignia Grand Sport showroom stablemate, and there still is. Uh, the price premium for a base petrol Insignia over, say, a 130 PS 1.2 litre petrol Astra is actually no more than around £800. And a base diesel Insignia costs around about the same as an Astra with the 122 PS 1.5 litre diesel engine we're trying here. Now, yes, of course, the Astra will be much more economical, but the Insignia's a larger, more spacious car, so food for thought. If you don't mind slightly less cabin space than you get in an Astra, provided an extra dose of style and fashion is delivered in return, then your dealer will point out that the brand's compact Crossland X SUV can be yours for much the same money as you'd pay for a directly equivalent Astra. If it's a family hatch you want though, then your point of comparison against this car will come from other brands. Now you might not be surprised to hear that Astra pricing closely replicates that of the car which is probably its closest rival, Ford's Focus. The Focus is a more modern design, but this Astra now enjoys an important advantage in running cost efficiency. Uh, that could be significant. Uh, thinking of this car's other key segment rival, Volkswagen's Golf, well you might want to think again if you don't like the idea of having to find a substantial model for model premium of around £3,000. A premium over Astra ownership will also be necessary if you want to consider either of this Vauxhall's PSA Group family hatch cousins. A Citroen C4 Cactus will cost you around £1,000 more, while for an equivalent Peugeot 308, you'll need to budget at least around £1,500 extra. What else might you be considering? Um, well, a Renault Megane or a Skoda Scala might save you a few hundred pounds, but both would cost you significantly more to run. Uh, Skoda's other contender in this segment, the Octavia, that costs around about the same as an Astra, and you'd also pay a similar amount for popular contenders in this segment, like Seat's Leon, Kia's Seed, and Hyundai's i30. But again, none of those cars can match this Vauxhall's levels of efficiency. As for other contenders, well, a Fiat Tipo would certainly save you a few thousand, but it would cost a lot more to run. It is more likely that you'll be considering something like a Honda Civic against this Astra. Uh, one of those would cost you around £500 more to buy, and you need to budget around £2,000 more for equivalent versions of the Mazda 3, the Mini Clubman, and for the 1.2-litre versions of the Toyota Corolla. If, having considered all those options, you've put them to one side, you've rejected the pull towards SUV ownership, and you've decided it is an Astra that you really like, then you're going to need to know just how generous Vauxhall has been with the standard spec. So let's take a look at that now. Even base SE spec gives you 16-inch alloy wheels, auto headlamps, dark tinted rear windows, powered heated mirrors, LED daytime running lights, and on the Sports Tourer variant, roof rails too. Inside there's air conditioning, there's a multifunction trip computer and cruise control with a speed limiter. Infotainment, that's taken care of by a seven inch center dash multimedia system with Bluetooth, a six speaker DAB audio system and a USB audio connection. There's also Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring. And that's a feature that some other brands will levy a subscription for after a few years of use. Vauxhall doesn't. As usual with this kind of setup, you'll be able to duplicate the functionality of your smartphone handset onto your car's infotainment screen to access maps and message reading, as well as apps like Stitcher, Podcast, Spotify and Umano. The starting point of the range for company buyers will be a business edition nav variant, which, as the trim name suggests, embellishes SE spec with navigation, plus it also gets full LED headlights, a leather-covered steering wheel and a front central armrest. 
The most popular trim option in the range amongst both private and company customers, though, is mid-level SRI spec, and that's available either with or without built-in navigation. Now, this flavor of Astra is identifiable from the base models by its larger 17-inch twin-spoke alloy wheels and its chrome-effect window surrounds. Plus, as well as the LED headlights, you get rain-sensing wipers, front seat back pockets, an alarm, and an anti-dazzle rearview mirror. Uh, there is also a plusher SRI VX line now variant which throws in 18 inch wheels front fog lights and dark rear tinted windows too for us though the main draw to settle on some kind of sri variant over a baseline astra derivative would lie in two things first that you have to buy into at least this level in the range to get any kind of camera driven safety kit on this car uh, more about that when we come to cover safety issues later on and secondly because at sri level there's the standard inclusion of voxel's brilliant 16-way adjustable driver's ergonomic active seat now here you get front sport seats that hold you more comfortably and securely they include lumbar support and they're certified by the german agr organization who campaign for seat design better suited to healthier backs of course there's always the chance that you feel your budget or more likely your company fleet managers can sustain something a little plusher in the astra lineup Keynotes of the next variant level up in the range, Elite Nav, which is what we have here, our full leather upholstery, and the upgraded Multimedia Navi Pro infotainment system, which gives you a larger 8-inch center dash screen and an 8-inch digital instrument cluster with a wide range of data configurability. Plus, Elite Nav models also throw in 17-inch multi-spoke alloy wheels, electronic dual-zone climate control, heat for both the front and the rear seats, a heated steering wheel, twin USB rear charging points too. You might not be quite so pleased to find that at this level a manual handbrake is swapped out for an electronic switch, but it is handy that Elite Nav models get all the camera safety features included as part of the Driving Assistance Pack 1 option that you'd have to pay extra for with most variants lower down the range. Now we'll cover that when we got onto safety. If budget for your Astra is of limited consequence, then your dealer will steer you towards top ultimate nav spec now incredibly this is the only trim level in the range that includes rear parking sensors as standard you also get front ones a rear view camera side blind spot alert and an advanced park assist auto parking feature all as part of the included parking pack Otherwise, the main draws here lie with IntelliLux LED matrix headlights that adapt their beam to suit surrounding traffic and a version of that AGR-approved ergonomic active seat we mentioned earlier, here coated with perforated leather upholstery and including an active ventilation backrest and a massage function. Ultimate nav spec additionally gives you 18-inch bicolor alloy wheels, LED tail lights, a heated windscreen, uh, a wireless phone charger, power folding mirrors, a more convenient 40-20-40 split for the rear backrest, and what Vauxhall reckons is a concert hall standard seven-speaker Bose audio system with a rich bass subwoofer under the boot floor. Right, on to options. Now here's a key one you should consider. Whatever flavor of Astra you decide on, the Vauxhall Connect eCall system. Now it replaces the previous OnStar concierge setup that the brand made so much fuss about when this Mark 7 K series Astra was originally launched. The eCall system works much in the same way as OnStar in that a cabin button's provided, connecting you through to an operator that you can call 24 seven for journeying information or in the case of emergencies or breakdowns but unlike that old setup, the operator can't directly download navigation directions into your car. It is still brilliant though to know that info on the nearest restaurant, fuel station, airport, train station or hotel is merely a button press away and that you can loan your car to say your grown up son or daughter with perfect peace of mind should they for instance run out of fuel or have a puncture or a breakdown on some dark deserted road. From launch, Vauxhall told us that eCall would add £415 to the price of an Astra. Unlike OnStar, there'll be no subscription charges to add to that after a period of use. 
What else? Uh, well, you'll probably want rear parking sensors, which, as we said, aren't included with any of the mainstream trim levels. Even more annoying is the fact that they uh, have to be ordered packaged up with front sensors, so you'll be paying nearly £500 more to get that feature. Uh, budget for this, uh, for the necessary extra cost emergency spare wheel, and the extra that you'll probably have to pay for your choice of paint colour, only solid Aegean blue is included as standard. And you'll need to expect to add on the best part of £1,000 to the cost of your car, or more if you ignore a finish like this model's Summit White and choose instead one of the various metallic shades. It all sounds to us like something to be factored into negotiations with your dealer. As for other extra cost features that you might want to look at, well, on the base SE and business edition variants, you'll probably want to add in an alarm. And to avoid backache on longer trips, we'd recommend that on those models, you pay the small amount extra that's necessary for the 16-way adjustable driver's ergonomic active seat we mentioned earlier. SRI buyers are offered an optional climate pack, which gives you electronic climate control, a heated steering wheel, heated front seats and rear floor heating ducts and a heated windscreen. Uh, that last feature can be individually added into an elite nav model like this one. And on most models, you'll have to pay extra for front fog lamps. To improve the cabin aesthetics, you can add in stainless steel sports pedals, branded illuminated door sill plates and tailored carpet mats. Uh, a practical touch that we'd recommend is the Flex Connect system, a flexible system of holders which attach to the headrest at the back of the front seats for gripping tablets, uh, shopping bags, jackets and drinks. To protect the boot floor, you might also want to consider a reversible hard cargo tray, plus of course you can specify a tow bar. And roof crossbars to hold a roof box or carriers that'll hold surfboards, skis, bikes and even kites. On to safety. Now with this revised Astra, Vauxhall headlines the inclusion of a new digital front camera, which is both smaller and more powerful than the one used before, thanks to a faster processor. It's now theoretically capable of recognizing not only vehicles, but also pedestrians. Uh, so making the brand's forward collision alert autonomous braking system more effective. Uh, there is a bit of important small print here though. Firstly, in the news that this camera doesn't actually feature on the entry level SE, and business edition trim levels that many Astra buyers will choose. These don't actually get any camera-driven safety features at all, and they can't be optionally ordered with any either. And that's rather an unacceptable thing amongst family hatchbacks in this day and age. And secondly, there's the fact that the pedestrian detection feature works only on Astras fitted with traffic sign recognition, which costs extra on almost every model. We hate small print, don't you? Uh, anyway, assuming you can buy into the range from mid-level SRI spec upwards, the ordinary version of that little camera features as part of what Vauxhall calls its Driving Assistance Pack 1. Now, as well as forward collision alert, which alerts you to hazards between 5 and 37 miles an hour, you also get a following distance indicator, which tells you how many seconds you are behind the vehicle in front, and lane departure warning with lane assist. Now that alerts you if you drift out of your lane and then it applies subtle steering lock to ease you back to where you should be. Uh, the traffic sign recognition system that we just mentioned, uh, which adds in the pedestrian detection feature, that can be ordered as an extra on most models for £275 more. A blind spot detection system, side blind spot alert, that's been developed for this car, but you can only have that with top ultimate nav spec, where, as we mentioned earlier, it comes all packaged up with that variant's standard parking pack. What about passive safety kit, the kind of things that every modern family car should now include? Well, as you'd expect, there's all the usual stuff, things like anti-whiplash head restraints, tyre pressure monitoring, ice fix child seat fastenings, and twin front, side, and curtain airbags, although there's no driver's knee bag. Plus, the front end section of the car is designed to reduce injuries in the nightmare scenario of a collision with a pedestrian. Electronic safety features include an ABS system with brake assist and hydraulic brake assist fade to help in emergency stops and those are advertised to following motorists by automatically activating hazard warning lights. 
There is also hill start assist to stop you from drifting backwards on uphill junctions and engine drag torque control, which stops the car skidding if, for example, uh, you select too low a gear on a slippery road. Plus you get rollover mitigation, a fading brake support feature and a brake disc cleaning system to keep your stopping distances at the optimum in the wet. Uh, the ESC stability control system meanwhile includes cornering brake control, cornering torque control and a torque vectoring by brake system all helping to keep stability through the bends. Uh, fit an optional tow bar and you also get a trailer stability program included to mitigate trailer sway. An opportunity was rather missed with the original version of this 7th generation Astra model. Uh, thanks to its weight reductions and its sleek aerodynamics, it should quickly have garnered a reputation as a class leader in terms of overall running cost efficiency. Uh, unfortunately though, the original engine range, which was largely carried over from the previous generation model, uh, just couldn't match the uh, technology that was on offer elsewhere in the car. The old diesel versions were still pretty frugal by class standards, but the 1.4 litre petrol variants really weren't. Competitors sighed with relief. They won't be sitting quite so comfortably after a perusal of the stats pertaining to this improved model though. Uh, this about that is the K-Series Astra we should have had from the start, complete with a set of fuel and efficiency figures which are now difficult to better in the segment, thanks primarily but not entirely to the freshly installed all aluminium three-cylinder engine range. Uh, there's no sign of the kind of trendy mild hybrid electrification that, uh, that Ford is now offering. Uh, those power plants don't even offer a cylinder deactivation system. None of this technology was really widely available a few years back when these Euro 60 units were being developed by General Motors, uh, which makes it all the more impressive that an across the board emissions efficiency improvement of up to 21% is being claimed for this improved model. Now in analysing that we will start on the engine side because that is undoubtedly where the biggest running cost gains have taken place. Uh, a three cylinder power plant is obviously lighter than a four cylinder one, around about six kilos lighter in the case of the 1.2 litre petrol unit uh, which boasts particularly low internal friction and uses a plastic inlet manifold to further skim off a few grams. Any doubts that uh, different power outputs from the same engine come only from minor software tweaks are put to rest here with the news that this one delivers exactly the same fuel and emissions figures uh, regardless of whether you choose it in 110, 130 or 145 PS guises. The figures in question are up to 54.3 mpg on the WLTP combined cycle and 99 grams per kilometre of NEDC rated CO2. That's for the hatch, think 53.3 MPG and 102 grams per kilometre for the Sports Tourer Estate. To give you some perspective on that, a rival Ford Focus 1 litre EcoBoost 100 PS model, uh, previously well ahead of this Astra in those areas, now looks much less clever, managing 50.4 MPG and 107 grams per kilometre. As you might have picked up from earlier sections in this film, if you want an automatic gearbox with your petrol powered Astra, uh, you'll have to switch to the alternative 1.4 litre three cylinder engine, uh, which the engineers have chosen to mate with a seven speed belt driven CVT stepless self shifter. Choosing a CVT box was intended to provide the kind of minimal downside in terms of auto gearbox efficiency stats, which is delivered by the DSG auto transmission that you'll get in the Volkswagen Group products. Uh, this petrol Auto Astra doesn't quite manage that. It records 50.4 mpg and 115 grams per kilometre of CO2 as a hatch and 48.7 mpg and 114 grams per kilometre in sports tourer form. The engine that Vauxhall really wants to talk about from an efficiency point of view with this car though is the 1.5 litre three cylinder diesel unit we're trying here. This benefits from a particularly sophisticated emissions reduction system consisting of a passive oxidation catalyst, an ad blue injector, an SCR catalyst and a diesel particulate filter. We've chosen the 122 PS version of this unit which with manual transmission uh, manages a WLTP rate 
rated combined cycle fuel reading of up to 64.2 mpg and 92 grams per kilometer of NEDC rated CO2 with either body style. Choose the nine speed automatic gearbox you can have with the diesel hatch variant we're trying today and the figures fall quite a lot are right down to 56.5 mpg and 109 grams per kilometer. It's the lower powered 105 PS version of this diesel that might really rack up the savings for you though. Uh, the straight fuel and emission stats don't look that much different from those of the uh, higher powered units. They're rated at up to 65.7 mpg and 90 grams per kilometer with either body style. More significant though is the news that in this form, uh, this power plant is RDE2 compliant. Uh, that jargon means that unlike most competitor diesels, it will meet all emissions regulations for the foreseeable future. As a result, and also unlike most competitor units, it's not liable for the usual 4% BIK diesel surcharge that a company user would normally have to pay. It all adds up to a saving over the pre-facelifted model's old 1.6 litre CDTI engine that over a four year, 80,000 mile ownership period, Vauxhall believes would add up to around a thousand pounds. And over the same time frame, uh, the company reckons that running this diesel Astra could save you as much as £1,800 over the cost of operating a comparable 1.5 litre Eco Blue engine diesel Ford Focus. Earlier we referenced the fact that engine technology isn't the only thing that explains that strong efficiency showing. Lightweight also helps. A 1.2 litre petrol model tips the scales at only 1.2 tonnes. That's an almost super mini style figure. Uh, also significant is the fact that an Astra can offer the sleekest aerodynamics in the sector. Uh, this hatch records a drag coefficient figure of 0.26 CD uh, and that's a reading that the Sports Tour Estate improves to 0.25 CD. Now those aero class benchmarks are achieved not only through sleek body shaping but also through numerous little details a ride height lowered by 10 millimeters a special engine compartment cover underbody optimization deflector shaped rear axle control arms an enlarged fuel tank heat shield which doubles as an air deflector and a front radiator grille with upper and lower portions which uh, can open and close independently of one another and that improves engine warm-up from a cold start and it further enhances frontal airflow. So don't underestimate the effect of all of this. Engineers will tell you that a 10% cut in drag can lower fuel consumption by up to 5% when you're driving at 70 miles an hour. Now Vauxhall reckons that the active grill shutter alone on this revised Astra has lowered its CO2 reading by 2 grams per kilometer. And of course, every percentage point gained in CO2 reduction will benefit an Astra driver's tax status. From launch, 1.5 litre diesel Astra manual model was rated with both engine outputs at 22%. That puts the car six benefiting kite tax bands lower than equivalent uh, Astral diesel in the pre facelifted range. For the 1.2 litre petrol model, the figure is 23% or 24% with the Sports Tourer. For this 1.5 litre diesel auto, it's 25% and for the 1.4 litre petrol auto it's 27 percent. As for vehicle excise duty, well for a manual Astra model that'll almost always be rated at 130 pounds for the first year then 145 pounds thereafter. Uh, with the lower powered diesel the first year payment falls to 110 pounds. Do bear in mind that the first year VED payments are quite a lot higher for the diesel and petrol autos. Uh, they're respectively rated at 150 and 170 pounds for your first 12 months of ownership. Obviously, the running cost figures that we've quoted will have quite a lot to do with your driving style. Uh, the age of this design is betrayed by the fact that there's no selectable eco-style driving mode setting of the kind that you can activate on a Focus or a Golf. On most Astra models, all you get is a trip computer showing average and instantaneous fuel economy. A few more efficiency tools are available to you if you have a plushly specced variant like this one, complete with the 8-inch digital instrument cluster display. Now from this you can select an eco index screen which shows a multicolored band uh, with a red marker which on a journey stays in the green zone for economical driving but it'll move into a yellow section if you power on. There's also a selectable economy trend graph which shows your consumption over the last few miles and there's a convenience consumers section that shows you how much features like the air conditioning are costing you in your energy consumption. And via the same screen you can also monitor AdBlue fluid levels and your remaining oil life. 
What else might you need to know? Uh, well, there's the usual stop-start system that cuts the engine when you don't need it, when you're stuck at the lights or waiting in traffic. And as an owner, you can download a useful My Vauxhall app via which you can take care of your Vauxhall online and booked maintenance visits. Uh, on that subject, at the point of purchase, you can choose from a range of prepaid Vauxhall care service plans. Uh, insurance ratings, uh, well, they're comparable with other mainstream brand models in this segment, and uh, residual values on Astra's are better than they used to be. Independent experts reckon that a typical 1.5 litre Turbo D 122 PS SRI hatch model would still be worth £6,750 after three years and 60,000 miles of use. That is very competitive with a rival Ford Focus, but it is a bit off what you get from a Volkswagen Golf. Finally, you'll also need to know that Vauxhall includes a three-year, 60,000-mile warranty as standard, and that's a package that can be extended up to five years and 100,000 miles at extra cost. A year's free breakdown cover, that's also included, along with a six-year anti-corrosion guarantee. So, to the bottom line, which is quite simply that it's time for the market to re-evaluate the Vauxhall Astra. You might have ignored the previous version of this 7th generation model because a Focus felt better to drive, a Golf felt better built, or any one of a whole series of potential rivals offered better value. But forget that now. To a great extent, it's reasoning that no longer applies. The closer you look at this car, the more readily you appreciate that. Thanks to the fresh range of three-cylinder petrol and diesel engines added as part of this update, it's now the most efficient contender in the class. And that suggests that the engineers behind this model really know how to get the most from combustion engine design, which is just as well, given the notable lack of the kind of electrified technology that you'll now find in many rivals. That's not really why the British public has rather fallen out of love with the Astra in recent years. Uh, think more in terms of an image issue and the rise of the SUV for an answer there. Which is why it might have served Vauxhall better to accompany its engineering updates with a few more visual striking changes to differentiate this much improved K-Series Astra from the original version we saw back in 2015. In the absence of this type of tinsel, a great many potential buyers might miss the impressively strong package that this car now offers in its segment. Still, if you've stayed with us this far, you won't be one of those people. And you'll perhaps be starting to feel that maybe this car deserves more than a second glance. It may these days be outsold by family contenders that once wouldn't have approached it in terms of customer numbers. Models like the Mercedes A-Class and the Kia Sportage, but it now has more than ever to offer the discerning buyer in this sector. Best of all, this Astra remains for the time being anyway, mainly British, with hatch and estate models built at Ellesmere Port near Liverpool to a quality at least as high as anything that the Japanese brands can manage. That reason alone might well be enough to give this car a place on your family hatchback shortlist. Fortunately for Vauxhall, there are also many others.